Yo, what is up? It is Diamond Gill. Make sure you check out W Energy, an energy drink that has no artificial colors, sugars, or calories. Use my promo code Diamond Gill for 10% off for every purchase you make. Pretty eyes, pretty thighs, shawty, she a dime. Demon girl, evil eyes, she be telling lies. Today, it is my pleasure to interview Dr. Ali Kadim Hosini, the CEO of Terasaki Institute and founder of Omi, a culture to be startup. So Dr. Kadim Hosini, thank you for being part of this episode. So in light of such a illustrious career, can we start with you taking us back and telling us about your background? Sure. Um, I grew up in Canada after being born in Iran. And and um, I when I was in Toronto, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I uh, went to University of Toronto and did chemical engineering because I heard that it's good to do engineering and I was good in chemistry. So once um, I was in the junior year, I started doing research and and I really fell in love with my research um, during the summers and it was related to tissue engineering and materials. And I wound up uh, becoming super passionate and that's what I did for the next you know, 25 years. Wow, okay. So no, I, I know you're another Dr. Langer student. So like, what do you take away from his lab? Yeah, so after I did my undergraduate and master's at the University of Toronto, I went to MIT for my PhD. And uh, Dr. Bob Langer is a historic figure. He is uh, one of the top scientists in terms of being able to not only do science, but also being able to take the scientific ideas and turn it into real world applications. So I really learned um, quite a bit in his uh, laboratory during my PhD. I learned um, about the whole translation process of science to real world um, products. And I also gained quite a bit of network of people that um, have continued to be uh, friends and advocates for the past 20 years. I really enjoyed uh, interacting with Dr. Langer because he is just an uh, incredible and supportive mentor. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of inspiring things about him that, you know, I, I really try to take away and adapt you know, adapt it for my own uh, career as well. Interesting. So I um, mean, so I, I know you're I mean you're also a leader in applying bioengineering solutions to precision medicine. So how, how will this lead to develop personalized solutions for a range of therapies for stuff like uh, organ failure to cardiovascular? Sure. So one of the things that we do uh, in my research is to try to take cells um, of individuals and then be able to model their tissues outside of the body. So in a way that these cells that we take and we put in a dish can organize and be able to mimic some aspects of the tissue that's inside the person. So every person is unique and being able to have cells that are specific to that person and responses that are specific to that person is really important. So, so basically by doing this, we can actually create mini avatars of peoples um, and how they respond to different types of drugs or how their disease progresses over time. So it's really allows us to understand the variability that exists between different people um, and model that. Right now we're in the AI age. Do you think AI is going to play a big role in your vision kind of? Of course, yeah, because obviously as you start collecting these sorts of data and mapping them to particular uh, genetic phenotypes of the people, so what is the, you know, the different genes and how they correlate with the different uh, patient outcomes, um, then this data can actually be fed into these um, uh, AI algorithms to be able to see prediction, um, see trends and um, give uh, predictions about how an individual may actually respond without ac actually having to take their cells, just being able to look at their um, genetic makeup and then say, based on what we understand, then you can actually 
this is the best drug that would work for you because you have um, this particular uh, set of genes. So, so I think that's how AI can become really powerful in, um, in exactly what we're doing, but also in many other uh, aspects of being able to image um, better inside the body, being able to um, make drugs based on particular um, molecular arrangements better. So there's a lot of different things that uh, AI can enable us. Yeah, and um, I mean, you also develop numerous techniques for controlling the behavior of patient giraffe cells to engineer artificial tissues and cell cell based therapies. So my question is, can you talk more about these types of types of techniques that you develop? Yeah. yeah. So we um, we've been very much interested in building tissues also for transplantation and inducing healing of wounds. So the way this is done is that we take cells and we combine them with different types of materials, typically in the form of porous scaffolds so that the cells grow on these kind of porous scaffolds that are kind of like plastic foams and the cells reorganize themselves on these scaffolds to make tissue. So we've worked a lot on building human and um, animal tissues using these sorts of technologies. And along the way, we've developed a lot of different types of materials that uh, helps us to control how cells behave outside of the body and be able to control that behavior so that we can actually build artificial tissues that can be used for transplantation to address organ shortage or um, be able to mimic human physiology in what I mentioned before, being able to have uh, tissues that mimic human response outside of the body. And, yeah. And that, I mean, so I think, I, I think, I think like one year ago, two years ago, I think people, people were transporting like kidneys into someone's it, it, were transplanting kidneys. My question is, Will this solution kind of solve the fact that like sometimes our, our organs get you know, turned down by our immune system, do you think? Yeah, so that is really one of the biggest challenges in organ transplantation, the fact that you have to have tissues that match the individual. So obviously, there are for many different people, they cannot find a matching organ because it's just very rare to uh, to have someone who can match you in, in terms of, and there's so few organs available for transplantation. So uh, one of the ideas is to be able to take cells, particularly stem cells from a person and then be able to grow tissues that will not get rejected because the cells are from the same person. So that's uh, the kind of work that tissue engineers try to do. They try to make tissues that are compatible with different individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you're also developing the uh, organ on a chip system. So I think I think right now in the, bot in the biotech industry, I think the big issue is drug development costs and stuff. And I think many startups have been failed because of the fact that they've wasted billions and they lost all of their money and they couldn't keep funding their research. So do you think these organ on chip systems could help lower the drug development costs? Yeah, so it really goes back to this whole concept that different people are different. So when a drug gets approved, um, it's basically done by a clinical trial. So you take hundreds of people, give them that drug, and then wait to see if the drug works and whether it has toxicity, side effects. So obviously everyone is different. So even if you do a large clinical trial, you can still have that drug get in the population and have very bad side effects on specific subsets of people. So that's really what these organs on a chips enable to be able to make um, little tissues of individuals in a way that you can see if a drug is toxic to them or whether the drug is going to be effective, um, even uh, be able to make models of the disease 
that you're trying to address and then be able to test different drugs on it and see which of these drugs can actually fix the disease that you have modeled um, outside of the body. So those are the kind of stuff that uh, we do. And obviously a lot of it involves processes like being able to understand biology, to grow and manipulate cells, and to be able to do a lot of interesting things with materials as well. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I know you're building bow tie organ on a chip systems with in, with um with um with inline sensors. So I mean, how did your early work in electrochemical bio sensors with with uh regeneration ability allow like inline monitoring of these uh organ on chip platforms? It's just we're talking about. Yeah. So when you make these tissues outside of the body, one of the things that you want to do is to actually understand how they're behaving. And a lot of biology is based on taking cells and destroying that tissue to understand how those cells are behaving. But obviously, if you want to continuously monitor this behavior, you don't want to destroy the tissue. So we worked a lot with uh, different sorts of people like engineers of different sorts to be able to make ways of looking at the cells and looking at the tissues and be able to predict how they're behaving without having to destroy them. So that's what some of these sensors are. They can actually measure things that are being released by the cells and based on those ingredients and those measurements be able to see if the cell is experiencing a good environment or a bad environment, whether it's going to die or whether it's going to thrive. Make sure to check out Audible and use my link audibletrial.com slash go for a free 3D trial. I mean, I, and I and your lab is also a leader in the biofabrication. So my question is, I wonder what biofabrication is and how like you're able to use it to regulate stem cells. Yeah, so we define biofabrication as really the ability to control the architecture of cells and materials um, in a way that you can generate three dimensional structures. So typically, that's done by techniques like 3D printing so that you can actually have cells that um, can get um, suspended in a solution kind of like jello. And then you can actually deposit these jello-like solutions onto a surface and be able to build structures on, on top of that. So that's really the whole concept of 3D printing of tissues and how uh, these technologies can enable this sort of um, um, tech, um, architecture. And the reason why we want to be able to do that is because inside the body, the way the cells are organized is very specific to each different tissue type. So recreating that kind of architecture at the level of the cells is very important. And that's what techniques like 3D printing allow us to do. I see. I mean, so uh, the next question is, is about your bioprint, your, your, your uh, bioprinting. I know you develop and popularize gelatin methic cryoloid, which is called gelma. So uh, what is gel MA or gelma and why is it one of the main materials for the whole 3D bioprinting? Yeah, so as I mentioned, when I when, when we do 3D printing of cells, you need to put the cells in an environment that they like. So typically, these are precursors to gels. So that's why I mentioned things like jello. Now, there's a lot of different materials that can make these gel like structures. Um, we started thinking about how to make simple materials. You know, the body has lots of different types of proteins in it. One of the main type of structural proteins is uh, things like collagens that you can denature um, and get uh, materials called gelatin. So what we do is we take this very simple material that 
mimics aspects of what's what are the materials inside our body that's or surround the cells and the cells are comfortable interacting with. And we make those materials in a way that they can be um, made turn from solutions to gels by shining light on it. So that's the kind of chemistry that uh, we have developed to be able to make these three dimensional structures by having materials that are originally derived from what's inside the body, the, the matrix that's in the body, that's the collagen. So it's it's really become a standard material in, th in 3D printing of tissues. And one of the main reasons it's become very popular is because it's simple and allows the cells to reorganize and remodel um, into things that are more mature and more tissue-like. Mm -hmm. I see. So, I mean, regarding the applications of, is it gel ma or gel ma? Like, what do you guys call it usually? We call it gel ma. Gel. So, yeah. So, regarding the application of gel ma, so how can gel ma be used for sealants and um uh, hemostats? Yeah. So, gel ma, as I mentioned, it's it's a material that is derived from biological materials inside our body mm -hmm. but at the same time it has modifications that makes it have unique properties so the whole ability to be able to take it from solution to a gel by shining light is one example so one of the things that we have seen with uh, gelma is that it's very easy to take gelma and make it in the particular ways with unique properties. So for example, by playing with some of the mechanisms, uh, we can actually make gelma that is sticky or it's stronger. And by doing that, you can actually make the kind of materials that allows one to uh, solve some of the problems in, that we face right now in surgery. So when a surgeon does uh, surgery, then oftentimes they need to close the incision and mm. be able to do it in a way that heals fast and the patient is not going to have too much discomfort. So making materials like Gelma for those applications is very useful because it allows us to make better biologically compatible surgical materials. So, I mean, I know you've done a lot of work in the 3D bioprinters area as well, uh, but you've developed an innovative multi-nozzle or multi-material bioprinter. So, I mean, you know, going back to the whole uh, organ donor sh shortage, you know, do you think 3D bioprinters could potentially solve this shortage and print real life organs? Yeah, I definitely think that's going to happen in the future. The real question, I think, is the matter of timing, how long that's going to take, and whether there is alternative approaches that are simpler and easier to, to use in hospitals to basically address the same problems. So, so that's really the, the unknown here. I think, you know, if there's no other solutions that makes better sense, then there is going to be enough time and technology development for 3D printers to develop and be able to do these sorts of things. Uh, but there may be other solutions, like for example, you know, being able to genetically modify uh, the injured site so that it heals faster or uh, create drugs or molecules that can induce faster um, healing. So, so there's a lot of ways to try to address this problem and building tissues is one of them. Yeah, and you know, regarding this whole bioprinting uh field, like what is the number one like obstacle that is blocking you guys right now? Yeah, it's really has stayed the same since I was a student, which is the inability to create very well vascularized tissues that can be bulky, as big as some of one's own organs, but at the same time you can perfuse blood and oxygen through it and be able to remove the waste materials from the cells. This is something that body does very well with its own blood vessel networks. But when you're trying to build it 
it's very challenging because the distance that a cell needs to be from a blood vessel to remain alive is just a few hundred tens of microns or it's few hundred microns or tens of microns. So it's very, very small. So to be able to create such a porous structure that all the cells remain alive as you're trying to build something as complex or as big as a piece of heart or a liver, then that's really the big challenge. I see. So, I mean, you also engineer a stereo lithography based power printer. So like what makes that power printer like different from some conventional power printers that we see on the market? Yeah, so people are using different approaches to print cells and materials. Some of the standard types of bioprinters are based on basically like a nozzle that dispenses materials and cells and you can control where this nozzle goes um, and you can build uh, structures by depositing materials from this nozzle. What we call stereolithographic printers are a little bit different because instead of having a nozzle that uh, dispenses the material, you actually uh, put masks that basically allow you to shine light through the mask so that you can actually um, gelify or induce solidification of the of a liquid of a particular layer. So by doing that, you can build structures in a way that you have, you can build one layer by having a particular mask that allows the light to penetrate and cross-link the material in a particular way. And then you can build another layer on top of that. And by doing this over and over, you can actually start creating a three-dimensional structure. So those are different types of technologies to be able to build these three-dimensional um, architectures. Uh, they both have their own advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, if you have something like a nozzle, it's simple to make things. Whereas if you have something like a, um, this mask-based approach, it's a little bit more complex, but it doesn't have the same challenges as nozzles. For example, in a nozzle, when you push the cells through this nozzle, they may die because of those kinds of uh, shear stresses and environments that delivering things through a nozzle does. So, so the, you know, these techniques have their own unique uh, advantages. And, you know, it's really why there's research and science going on into different ones to be able to figure out what's the right solution. Yeah, so I actually have a question. So I have a friend who owns a, a 3D printer, right? So my question is like, how much do 3D bio printers cost? Because I don't see many people have it at home or something. Yeah, so the same printers that people use in their homes to print plastics and things like that can be used to print cells as well. Uh, it's just a matter of putting in the right type of material and cells so that instead of printing the plastic, it prints those cells. So, so it's it's definitely possible. The the early versions of these 3D bioprinters were even inkjet printers or other types of um, just uh, normal printers used to print um, on paper that people had used to print cells and materials. So it's a it's definitely the, the, there's a lot of adaptability and um, modifications that can be done with uh, existing tools. So, I mean, the regarding like inks, I know you, you made different bio inks for various tissue engineering applications. So can you talk more about these bio inks? Yeah. So a bio ink is basically the type of material that you use to print the cells and there's specific properties, specific things that you want in that bio ink. Some of it is them being good for cells and the cells being happy inside these materials. There's other things like how printable they are, what are their properties in terms of how you can take them from the gel form that they have when they come out of nozzle to a structure. So there's a lot of different properties that we want. And one of the things that we've done is we worked with optimizing the material properties of these um, inks so that we can use them 
to print different types of cells. We can use them to make um, different types of tissues and um, be able to control things like resolution or degradation of the material, how long it stays and how the cells reorganize themselves inside it. Yo, what is up everyone? It's Diamond Yo. Make sure you guys check out Newsly, an on one audio super app for iOS and Android. It picks up the most trending articles on the web on topics you choose at any given moment and reads through them to you in a natural human voice. For the first time ever, the entire web becomes listenable all in one place. Browse articles from topics you choose and start playing. Stop scrolling, start listening. You can follow any topic as specific as you like, from sports, tech, business, science, Doge Corner, even Elon Musk. It will find you the latest articles and read them to you aloud. And they have podcasts as well. Explore trending podcasts from over 80 countries. My, pod, my podcast is there too. I started using it as my default podcasting app. They even have, have digital radio. Download and use Newsly for free now from www.newsly.me or from the link in the description and use promo code early morning. All capital letters linked in the description receive a one month free premium s- subscription. Yeah, so, you know, can you, you know, explain, like, the difference between, like, a bio-ink and a normal, like, 3D printer ink? So, bio-ink has to be useful for printing cells, whereas normal 3D printer ink could be just a standard plastic that if you can't put cells inside it. So, so that's, you know, because in bioprinting, you print the cells at the same time as you print the ink material, the bio ink has to be friendly to cells. Uh, whereas normal plastics, you, you can have you know toxic things inside them and still be able to to 3D print. But 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 like but like let's say someone who doesn't know much about bioprinting, it, it still looks the same as normal 3D printed printer ink, right? Kind of. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's it's they're both things that you can print. It's just a matter of you know how the cells interact with those materials. I mean, yeah, you're also about the pioneers, the smart patches for chronic wound healing. So I mean, I've been trying to wrap my head around this. Like, how is it possible to have like a device that senses the wound but also does rapid drug intervention at um at the same time? Yeah. So you know, a few years ago when this whole concept of making electronics that are flexible and stretchable and have unique properties came along, we started thinking about how to apply those sorts of advances in technology to medical problems. And one of the things that we saw for wound healing is that it's a dynamic process. What you need changes over time as the wound heals. And there's also other processes like wound infection or those sorts of things that requires alternative interventions. So we started thinking about these patches that are kind of like what you use normally to cover a wound in terms of it's like just a patch, but it actually has sensors. So you can sense how the wound is healing. It has... Um, the ability to drug to to deliver drugs or antibiotics as the wound requires it. And by doing that, you can basically make sure that the healing process uh, happens better because you're giving the wound what it needs as opposed to, you know, just kind of have a patch that is just trying to keep the blood uh, from, you know, coming out. So So those are some of the things that I think the way medicine is gonna move forward in the future, which is gonna be more data-driven, more feedback loops, um, as opposed to just static devices. Yeah, man, so uh, have you like commercialized this smart patches yet? Cause I think a lot of people may need it. I mean, it's better than a bandage it sounds like, you know? Yeah, so we've been definitely working on trying to do those sorts of things. One of my students um, has a company that he formed around this concept of a smart patch. Um, It's something like the translation of these technologies 
from what you do in the lab to actually being a ready product takes many years and a lot of effort. So, so for this particular technology, there is uh, some of my students that that is working on it, as well as other companies built by, you know, other professors. Um, but, but yeah, so there, you know, I have a lot of other things that keeps me very busy. I see, because I think that's really cool. Because you know, I think it, I just just think putting on a bandage, bandage, and it throwing away is just such a waste, in my opinion. You know. Yeah, I think you know, and for us, it's definitely a. Uh, something that is less of an issue compared to someone who has, let's say, di diabetes and has diabetic yeah. foot ulcer or these non-healing wounds where it actually becomes even a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, I, I also know you carried out, you carried out you know, research in uh, micro, in cells and biomaterials. And I think one of your research was on cell docking. Can you still can you explain what cell docking is? Yeah, so... We one of the things that one wants to do is to be able to integrate cells in micro devices so that you can actually perform assays, be able to see how the cell is behaving, and as opposed to in a big dish. So, so oftentimes you need to be able to put cells in particular locations. Um, so this ability to create structures inside these micro devices to be able to capture and localize and analyze how the cells are behaving over time is also another technology. And that is, you know, when you think about it, let's say if you have a river running, which is kind of large scale fluidics, um, if you have a little piece of rock and you have, you know, a person standing on it, it can actually be in the middle of the river, but the person can stay there. And this is the same kind of concept with cells. We can actually make structures that allows the cells to remain protected, even though there's fluid moving around them. I see. So, Ahmed, you also combine silicon nanoparticles with gelatin to engineer the shear thinning materials of the embolization of, of blood vessels. So I know you co-founded a company called uh, Obsidio Medical from it. First of all, why was this such a breakthrough and like how hard was it getting this product approved by the government? Yeah. So one of the things that I didn't know much about was really this area of medicine called interventional radiology. So radiology, of course, is imaging inside the body um, and uses techniques like x-ray to do that. What these interventional radiologists do is they use those imaging capability, but then they use tools to be able to basically manipulate things inside the body with that technology of imaging. So they can actually um, use um, little tubes called catheters and they can navigate the blood vessels inside um, a person. So one of the problems that exists is that a lot of times people have things like internal bleeding or they have weaknesses in their blood vessel that forms um, balloons that are called aneurysms. So these sorts of medical problems are could be very bad. You know, if you have bleeding inside your body, you could die. So there is sort of interventions that requires an interventional radiologist to go and be able to solve these sorts of problems. And one of the ways that that's typically done is to deliver a coil to that, to that region so that the coil stays in place and induces blood to coagulate around it and it blocks that region so that if you have internal bleeding it would stop or if you have an aneurysm you wouldn't have blood continuously circulate around this um, balloon so we developed a technology that uses some of the materials that i mentioned um, things that are coming from tissue engineering world but they're so they're gels that they they can be delivered through these catheters 
So they kind of work like toothpaste to some degree. You can deliver them, they come out and they can actually stay in place. So I worked with a clinician who was an interventional radiologist. We developed the technology and then uh, we worked with an entrepreneur who actually uh, was the CEO of the company that emerged. And this company uh, took about three years to get regulatory. So we went through the FDA and we demonstrated that this product was safe and it worked. Um, and it got uh, approved last year by the FDA and now it's being used in people. What is up? It's Dami Go Back again. Make sure you check out LibSign, a podcasting distribution platform. If you want to start your own platform or podcast, use my promo code DG to sign up for two months free of LibSign. Sign up on www.libsign.com. Uh, well, congrats. I know it takes a long time to get approved by the FDA. Yeah, definitely. It was a very uh, interesting experience to kind of go through that process from the idea to actually seeing it in patients. So I know Obsidia was acquired by Boston Scientific. So you know, why do you think Boston Scientific want to acquire Obsidia? Yeah, so, so a lot of these medical device manufacturers and distributors already have the network and the customers for selling these sorts of products. So they actually have people at all kinds of different hospitals. They have their relationships. So what they always are on the lookout for are new types of technologies that can enhance the experience of the patients and decrease the number of failures that exist in these sorts of processes. So because they had a significant portfolio around technologies for interventional radiologists, when this product got approved, then they actually came and um, thought that, and us and then we both thought that it would be a very good um, thing in their portfolio. Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, I also saw from Bao, you were a senior principal scientist at Amazon. So, I mean, why do you decide to take a job at Amazon? Because it doesn't seem to have any connection with it being in the biology world. Yeah. So, Amazon is a really incredible company because they have been able to not only make a huge amount of impact in delivering packages and all that stuff, but they also have a unique culture that is based on keeping people accountable to a certain set of what they call leadership principles, which is a core way of performing and behaving. So I really wanted to kind of learn about how a company can scale to the level where it has a million people, but they all adhere by the same culture. So the other thing about Amazon is that it has lots of different businesses that it does, and it's always looking for a new opportunity. So Amazon is looking into healthcare space. There's um, projects and other initiatives that they have in the healthcare space. And when I was thinking about taking a sabbatical and doing something in industry, it just made sense for me to kind of try to venture out and do something that was a little bit different from what I had been used to. And it was a great experience. I always encourage people to do these sorts of things that they normally wouldn't get exposed to because it really uh, increases um, the ability to have a more open perspective. Do you mind telling us like about the research topic you're doing at Amazon? Yeah, so a lot of it obviously is proprietary to Amazon because that's kind of, they want to keep it uh, to themselves. But what I can say is that Amazon has um, groups that are looking at industries that Amazon is not already having major business in. And the purpose of these groups is to come up with business models that actually 
allows the future of Amazon. So if you know uh, something about Amazon AWS, which is their cloud services, it was actually developed like that. Amazon was not doing cloud services, but then internally they saw that, oh, this could be an interesting thing for us to get involved with. And then it became their main business, the most profitable part of the company. So, so that's kind of like the kind of internal innovation that company like Amazon does always trying to come up with new uh, ways of um, reinventing itself. Yeah. I mean, so let's move on to, I guess, your companies. I know you're a board member for in tribal. So, I mean, I know during COVID, there's a lot of, you know, they say like self tests at home tests. So like what makes in tribal different from these other companies? Yeah. So that's a company that has done a lot of really interesting things in um, developing these uh, home tests. And obviously that um, is something that um, was very, very needed during the pandemic and it's different now. So it's so what the company is doing now. It's actually doing a lot of really interesting uh, development of technology and software for healthcare, which is going to be a much more um, broader platform. Um, one of the things I can say about kind of being able to be involved in companies like this is that you, as a board member, you get the opportunity to be involved, but at the same time, you're not so, so involved that you can't do anything else. So it really opens up um, the, the ability to understand new areas and to be able to meet new people really expand your network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know, I think during COVID-19, um, and tribal was part of the whole rapid, um, the rapid, uh, COVID test at home. I would say the fascinating thing is thinking tribal has an AI powered, powered app. So I mean, like what role did the AI play in these at home tests? Cause it's kind of interesting, you know? Yeah, so there's a lot of computational capability that's uh, needed to do at-home testing and then be able to electronically send the information um, to you know, different people, like, for example, medical doctors or, uh, or people like that to be able to prescribe therapeutics. Um, so... This is really, the, I think, the future of healthcare. I think there's a lot of work in trying to make healthcare more streamlined so that you don't have to, for everything, go stand in a line, uh, get appointment to see a doctor. But how do we make these things a lot more accessible, a lot more efficient? And this is where companies that have the technology to be able to easily bring the patient and the doctor together and be able to facilitate the exchange of information and interaction between them in a very seamless way, I think are going to be having a great opportunity to make the future of healthcare. Yeah. I mean, I, let's take like in Travis example, like, do you think this business model could potentially lower the cost of these self-tests? Because I know many friends who had COVID, they had to test. And you said, said, oh, it was really expensive. So, yeah, I think definitely ways in which you can make the process more efficient can always reduce cost. If you don't have to do hospital visits, that always makes it a lot cheaper. If you can get your prescription by having, let's say, a um, teleconference with your doctor as opposed to physically going there again it makes it more efficient and cheaper so so these sorts of technologies really try to take the medicine and the medical world to 21st century because that's a very conservative community so they like to keep things the way they have always been and it's time for medicine to meet tech in a way that it makes it as um, as efficient as a lot of other things that we do. Do you want to increase your aim accuracy by 30%? This episode is sponsored by Swift Grips. Use my code DIAMONDGO for 10% off all products, including controller grips and shakers. 
Yeah, so I mean, let's move on to O Meat. I know you're the founder CEO of O Meat. So I mean, what got you involved in the meat industry? Yeah, so one of the most important things that's happening to the world right now is、uh, obviously things related to the destruction of the environment, global warming,、um, and a lot of things about loss of biodiversity. Uh, zoonic diseases; these are diseases that get transferred from animals to humans, like、mm-hmm. COVID nineteen. So there's a lot of issues that are in the world today. And when you look at the major causes of these issues, a significant fraction of it is because of us taking over the planet. You know, one of the things that I was very surprised by is to. Learned that ninety six percent of the mass of mammals on the planet are humans, and what we eat in terms of the livestock that we grow to eat. So the rest of the four percent are everything else, like elephants and giraffes、mm-hmm. and whales and all that stuff. So we've basically have taken over the planet, and because of that, we are putting unreasonable demands on the planet.、Um, And that's really a big problem. So, food production, particularly meat production, is a major, major cause of this. And it's not only a huge environmental issue, but there's also a lot of issues associated with basically animal welfare and slaughter that happens. So, what Omit is trying to do is to eliminate those problems by being able to take cells. From animals, but never have to actually slaughter the animal. So you can make those cells grow outside of the animal and be able to use those cells to actually make meat. So that you can not only eliminate slaughter, so you don't have to actually kill the animal to get、uh, meat, but also be able to make it in a way that's much more environmentally friendly, and at the end, it's much more sustainable. Than what we're doing right now, which is you know factory farming. I mean, so does Omi own those cows that you take the cells out of? Yeah, we do. We、uh, Omi has its own farm that it uses for getting the ingredients, and it's very important for us to make sure that the cows that we have are basically have the highest standard. So we don't use、um, what they call feedlots, which is kind of. Having cows in very concentrated、oh, yeah. areas and just kind of feeding them things that they're not evolved to eat. So we have our cows in pastures. They live their entire lives on these pastures, and just very infrequently we collect these sorts of ingredients that we need to make the meat. And then the meat is made inside these things that are like beer brewing、um, tanks. And we grow the cells in those tanks and make the mass of meat that's needed to process into real meat. So I mean, like, how do you guys take cells out of it? Do you do you cut something out of it or no? So there's like very thin needles that are used in human, for example, to take biopsies. So if someone has a tumor, for example, and you want to see what the cells are in that. Tumor, then you poke it with very fine needles, and you can take a little bit of cells that you can then analyze. We use the same kind of process with the cows. So just a little bit of piece of tissue through a biopsy that has the cells that we want, and then we can grow those cells into the muscle or the fat that makes the meat. I see. So I mean, in total, like how long is this process? And is it costly to manufacture this meat? Yeah, so the process is a lot more efficient than raising a cow,、oh. because when you're raising a cow, you grow it for two, three years before you slaughter that cow. Whereas in this process, the cells can become meat in about a month. So, so that ability to really shorten the time to make meat, as well as decrease the environmental footprint. The carbon footprint of the process really allows us to make more sustainable、uh, alternatives to、uh, factory farming. Yeah, so I just want to make sure. So there's no GMOs, no other ingredients, artificial ingredients. 
Yeah, in our process, we do not use those um, because, and we don't use even added plant-based ingredients. We just kind of grow the cells um, so that, you know, at the end you have something that's like very similar to what's inside a cow, just cells that have grown from it. What grocery stores and restaurants is Old Meat Plant to cater to? Yeah, so Old Meat is going to get its regulatory approval, um, I think, within the next year. And we're going to first go to restaurants, particular restaurants, which we partner up with and sell the meat through them. And then subsequent to that, then we will you know, go to, you know, um, distribution and other sorts of places. Oh, yeah. So which restaurants I'm at? Cause, at cause I actually... It's not it's not determined yet because, you know, we have to pick which chefs, which brands we want to partner with. And at this point, those are not yet determined. So have you personally tried um, old meat before? Yeah, so I've take, tasted more old meat than anyone else in the world, I would say. Um, so it's, yeah, and I'm still standing and I'm still living, so it's good. And you still have the same juicy taste and the same uh, proteins as, as like a beef. As, yeah, as a beef we pack. worked a lot on the developing the the sensory experience, the taste, texture, nutritional profile uh, of the meat, as well as we worked a lot on being able to reduce the costs so that the meat that we produce at the end is going to be competitive and be at the same prices as meat that you get in the store. So uh, will only ever expand to make like sustainable chicken, pork or fish? Exactly. Yeah, those are all within our future plans. Um, the reason we started with beef is the beef is the most destructive in terms of its environmental impact. Uh, and it's by far the biggest source of greenhouse emissions from farming. But but definitely our goal is to move into all of those areas. And I think Americans consume a lot of beef. So that's Very the market. Good. Yes. So will only be like expensive for like people like me I want to buy it or is it like what two dollars five dollars fifteen dollars like yeah so obviously as we scale make bigger and bigger um facilities the price is going to come down initially we envision that the price will be per pound somewhere let's say around twelve dollars per pound but as we scale then we think that that ground beef will come down to be somewhere um similar to what um, it is with current meat, like 3 to $5 per oh, pound. All right. Well, yeah, uh, I'm excited for old meat. I'll see which restaurants you guys are going to be catering to. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. I think, you know, um, Gen Z and millennials are going to be the people who really um, ad adopt these sorts of meat alternatives because, you know, this is the planet that, you know, we've left them. So we have to, you know, kind of um, the sustainability aspect of the planet has to improve. And they're the ones who are going to live in this planet the longest. Um, yeah, because when I was doing my research, I thought Omi was making vegan meat. That's what I thought. But I realized as I read research, I was like, oh, that's not the case. So something, something, yeah, something no, this different. Is like, yeah, yeah, this is um, actual cells from animals. Yeah, exactly. yeah, this exactly. plant based, yeah. So I'm, I I know now you're the CEO of the Terasaki Institute. So like, what made you want to leave UCLA for this? For no yeah, profit? so I wanted to kind of create a program where scientists can solve particular problems, but also be able to be involved in translating those into the real world, which means that having the ability to work with the companies that are emerging from their science. So that's very difficult to do at a typical university. And we basically created a process at the Institute to be able to facilitate that. So why is it hard to create in a college? Is it because of bureaucracy or is it something else? I think bureaucracy, the fact that university's mission at the end is not to spin out companies and make products is to educate people. So the, this um, innovation is down the list in terms of its priority. And every time you have university, which is a nonprofit 
working with a for-profit company, there's lots of complexity about how to handle these interactions. And sometimes just the universities don't want to deal with it. They say, oh, we don't want to have anything to do with that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I noticed Hirosaki, like they have their own like accelerator or uh, incubator. So did Omi come from this? Exactly. So Omi spun out of the Terasaki Institute and the company licensed the intellectual property from the Terasaki Institute so that it can actually um, develop the technology. How is Terasaki different from other accelerators in, in Southern California or just across the U.S.? Yeah, the fact that it's integrated with the Research Institute um, allows for much more seamless um, translation between what the science that's done at the Institute and what we come out. And we hope that at the end, it just makes the entire process a lot more efficient. So do you have any advice for students or just mm -hmm. young scientists? I think the most important thing I would say is that explore a lot of different things, get exposed to many different things and find what it is that you like and what it is that you don't like. Because um, at the end, spending your life on things that you don't like is not fun. Um, so being becoming really passionate about particular areas and um, having the, the drive to push it forward and accomplish things in it, I think it's very exciting. I see. Yeah. Do you want to talk about any other points? Yeah. The only other thing I would say is that, you know, I'm always eager for anyone who has any questions. They can um, communicate with us. My email is ali at terasaki.org. And always happy to uh, meet young, uh, new people. And we do have internship programs and other things oh. that I think students would be uh, interested in. Oh, yeah. So I'm interested in trying all me because I've never tried something that came from cells. So I am excited. You know, just let me know which restaurant in LA you guys are, because I live in the Bay. Yeah, it's a yeah. short drive, you know. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Dr. Kadim Hosini, for being part of this episode and giving me the opportunity to talk about sustainable meat bioprinting and also business. Thank you. Amazing. You know, you did an incredible amount of research. I'm very impressed.